In tonight's Flying Squad, the last of the present series, the faces of some police personnel have deliberately been obscured at the request of the police. Attack, attack, attack. Target one's making his way to the red vehicle. On the pavement. In earlier episodes, this series has watched the flying squad on operations. This program looks at the men who join the squad and the problems and pressures they face. In November 1987, Detective Chief Inspector Bill Mellish took charge of the 45 detectives at the Tower Bridge branch of the Flying Squad. Uh, you know, I've been here for two weeks. I'm a 22-year serviceman. I'm thoroughbred CID. I'm born and bred in South London. I perceive being the operational DCI at Tower Bridge as the pinnacle of my career. Please God, I shall get made the next rank and maybe after that. But at the moment, as a career objective, the operational DCI of Tower Bridge is the tops for me. And I'm very, very, very proud to be here. Of the four flying squad branches working exclusively on armed robberies, Tower Bridge is the busiest. It covers South East London, one of the most notorious areas for violent crime in Britain. Our goal and convict as many armed robbers as possible. The only way we're going to do that is by hard work. I tell you, when I was a DI here last time, there was lazy officers in the office then. And the law of ravages says there are guys here that are not given 100%. Law of ravages, dust on the car, whichever way you want to do it, it's a fact of life, there is room for improvement in this office. I promise you, I will task the DIs with identifying those guys and telling them, come here old boy, you are not giving 100%. Ask for a reason, mark his card and tell him. If he doesn't improve, we get rid of him. It's as simple as that. And possible. I promise you, it's possible. The police officers, okay. you're under arrest for oh. robbery. The flying squad see themselves as being the elite of the force, and competition to join is tough. Yeah, loud and clear, go. They're all experienced detectives when they join, usually after 10 years or more in the CID. The tour of duty on the squad is normally three years. Right, gents, uh, the operation today is relating to a armed robbery which is going to hopefully occur at, uh, in Bond Street in the West End. Of the 174 detectives in the four flying squad branches that cover London, nine are women. But the only woman at the Tower Bridge branch who goes out on operations is Scenes of Crime Officer Jackie Kello, a civilian forensic specialist. Obviously when I first got there I, um, I thought it was going to take an awfully long time to feel at ease, but I felt at ease relatively quickly, within months. Um, I don't know about them, they're all extremely nice to me. Um, and I expect they thought when I first got there, oh God, there's some dippy woman coming along. It's a dangerous job, a very dangerous job, and uh, I think um, one's got to bear that in mind when putting, putting women into situations like that. Would you like your wife to do it? No, she, she wouldn't, uh, no, I wouldn't. It would be, it's, a, it's a horrendous job for a woman, I would think. 991, do you foresee any problem from uh, that last manoeuvre, over? Because we are dealing with armed robbers, firearms, very heavy situations. I don't know how they think a woman might react sometimes. 
996, come round, come down, come down. Yes, yes, we're number foot. Society's making them change slightly. I mean, I've arrived. <laughs> First of many, hopefully. It's very much a male domain there. Um, definitely a male stronghold. It clearly wouldn't want to put a woman officer up front where, unless she was an authorised shot, um, but if she wasn't an authorised shot, we clearly wouldn't put her up front in, a, in an armed robbery situation. We would use armed officers and, and, uh, and some of the strongest officers that we've got to deal with those people. But that's no, um, that's no bar for, for, for women coming up here. I mean, we've, we've got vacancies for women, we'd love to fill them. I'm definitely not one of the boys and I never will be. But as time's gone on, um, I found it much easier to be in their company. Um, I feel more and, more and more at ease with them and possibly they do with me. I don't really know. Do they chat you up much? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> it, 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 it must have been that. Means. I'm not going to say anything about any of that. <laughs> it's management, can we? <laughs> You want a big one? Last year, the Flying Squad were armed on 690 operations, but only used their guns once. At the Tower Bridge branch, there are eight authorised shots, all volunteers. Right, who's next? I'll find you an easy incident. I'll find you an easy incident. Training in the use of firearms is by PT-17, the Tactical Firearms Unit. Okay. There's a two-week initial course and a refresher day every quarter. Settle yourself in, wait for the next incident. Why did you shoot this man, officer? Why did I shoot him? Yes. He's got a shotgun in his hand and he's pointing it at me. Was there any other way you could have dealt with this? Shutting the cupboard door wouldn't have been a lot of good, would it? <laughs> Some seem to take to it naturally. Others... You can, you can spend weeks training them and then really they're, they're not happy with a gun. The most difficult decision of all for an armed policeman is when to fire. Too soon and someone entirely innocent could be killed. Too late and the policeman could be the victim. There is one lad on the course, a staff have sort of said, well, we think that he's not going to make it. Not that he's going to crack or, I think that's a bit dramatic, but that he's not going to make the grade. He's not going to be, be suitable material. Whether he's going to crack in this, I suppose, a psychological sense, we can't really tell. We've done a lot of tests and trials in the past, but we're not really there yet. What normally happens is they get weeded out during the training. So it would be quite unusual for somebody to come up to us to have access to a police firearm and, and then turn out to be unsuitable. Our assessment of that person would just be the final long stop. Up until now, we, we've not had to take people off because uh, they have remained eminently suitable. One day, two injured. One of the most worrying developments in robberies is the increasing use of firearms by the villains. In this robbery at Woolwich, six shots were fired at the police and one policeman was wounded. This man is a convicted bank robber who has become a police informant. There's a £20,000 contract out for his death and he has police protection. He admits to having used firearms. If they're policemen, do you see them as being fair game? Well, they're doing a the job, aren't they? So, does that mean you can shoot at them? Well, put this way, it doesn't mean you can do anything, but it's either you or them. So, if it came down to it, and it was your liberty at stake, you would shoot a policeman? Yes. And have no second thoughts about it? Well, you wouldn't have time to think, would you? Well, one is shot at, um, and it doesn't obviously injure you, you can think, well, another two feet either way, perhaps it would have killed me. And if you think like that, um, it's going to mentally, obviously, be a tremendous pressure. They never show out to their colleagues that they're concerned because it's probably a macho world that we operate in. Blokes suppress it, and perhaps that's when the stress comes into it. But I know people who, after 
an incident that's happened and say, Christ, what the hell have I gone into? What, what was I doing there? You know, it's, uh, it's something, the adrenaline just puts you into situations. And then afterwards, when it's all over, the old sweat comes, you think, my goodness, look at the situation I was in there. That can happen quite often. It's a stressful job, but equally it's, uh, it's a very enjoyable job. And I think from the, um, uh, the experiences you've had with, with the Tower Bridge officers that, uh, yeah, they work hard and they play hard. <laughs> Senior flying squad officers are aware of the problems that can result from the continued pressure under which their men work. With the build-up of tension caused by long periods of waiting followed by violent action, alcohol could be a release. Drinking and driving. Gentlemen, drivers, I spit the squad, flying squad drivers. If you drink and drive, you get nicked, you're out. You know that. You're out the flying squad. If you carry on the way you have been carrying on, drinking and driving, somebody's going to get nicked. The ramifications afterwards of not having a car to drive are horrible to think about, queuing for buses and all the rest of it, but it's just unprofessional. Mellish then turned to another cause of pressure on his men, the continual frustration of seeing robbers they are convinced are guilty being found not guilty in court. We will keep a list here at Tower Bridge Flyers Club of bent defence counsel, bent defence solicitors. If as the days go by, you are privy to corrupt, immoral actions by defence counsel or defence solicitors, I want you to come back, debrief, and we put it in a book. The reason I want this done, I'm not talking about gossip or you in there, no, it's overt, immoral, corrupt, bent actions by these people is because there are certain chief superintendents out on the division that do not believe that these people exist. The flying squad commander, John O'Connor, works in the more politically sensitive atmosphere of Scotland Yard. I wouldn't be prepared uh, to make any sweeping statements about so-called crooked lawyers. You're probably aware that I've had a detective inspector who has looked at all allegations made by uh, police officers about uh, unprofessional conduct. Um, and I have to say that none of them stand up to um, prosecution or even to, uh, internal, to uh, internal discipline by the, uh, the law society. It's those solicitors that are paid inordinate amounts of cash money to service their clients' requirements, which includes concocting false alibis, concocting a defence after the pro prosecution case has been uh, laid down, um, utilising whatever means are available to them, whether it be false witnesses uh, or whatever. That's what I mean by a bent solicitor. The fact that a solicitor may believe that his client is guilty and yet defends him to the hilt. That's what he's paid to do. Doesn't make him corrupt, and it doesn't make him crip, doesn't make him a criminal. That's what the man's job is. And my officers have got to realise that, that they're looking, they're, they're looking at one side of, the, of where they stand in the, uh, in the legal puzzle. But the why solicitors... are they also convinced that there are these bent solicitors around? Because some solicitors uh, are clearly making a very, very good living at defending professional armed robbers. And it may be that, uh, that some solicitors have been seen in, in the company of armed robbers, socialising with armed robbers. Doesn't make them corrupt, doesn't make them criminals. Are there also bent barristers? Of course there are. Only earlier this year, Lord Mackay was uh, quoted as saying that he was saddened that he'd been informed that there are incompetent barristers, corrupt barristers. Yes, there are bent solicitors, barristers, and above. And um, basically it depends on um, what help they can give you. Well, what help can they give you? 
Well, they never tell you that. They just promise you results. Getting them to court is really uh, half the battle. The, the real battle is um, in court and uh, all aspects of the court. I'm quite satisfied that we have lost cases uh, against armed robbers because of the malfunction, the corruptness of solicitors for the defence and barristers for the defence. Quite satisfied. The bullets are in his left hand trouser pocket with the tissue. Yeah. As a result of the robbery and shooting at Woolwich, Ronald Easterbrook was sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment. During his trial at the Old Bailey, a juror was removed from the jury when it was discovered he had a criminal record. Although never an issue in this case, the intimidation of members of a jury, known as nobbling, is a major concern of the flying squad. Intelligence sources will indicate that trying to intimidate the jury is a frequent event, particularly at the Old Bailey. With what success? I don't know. I don't know. My experience and my judgment would indicate some success, that there are juries that are nobbled at the Old Bailey and defendants are acquitted directly as a result of that nobbling. What percentage, what success rate, I honestly don't know. But I'm, again, a man of experience, my judgment is that this does happen, and quite often. Once they're ID'd in a courtroom, they're marked, and they're followed. Find out what pubs they're going, where they drink, are they short of money, are they in debt, put them through the computer, find out if they're in a debtor's court, have they got any county court judgments against them, um, find out their weakness, basically. We're going to talk about targeting later. Mellish was also concerned with another source of frustration among the Tower Bridge team, financial restrictions. I'm aware, and I've been for a number of years, as we all have, about the Metropolitan Police policy of financial budgeting. I, and I'm sure you are, we're all in favour of good housekeeping. What I detest is the obscene obsession with economic accountability to the gross detriment of Joe Public. To fight crime properly, to arrest plenty of criminals so you're going to reduce the crime rate is expensive. Still a lot of pedestrian traffic now. Yeah, As a result of a tip-off, the Flying Squad mounted a surveillance operation on a Bond Street jewellers for two Saturday afternoons. The overtime costs were about £2,000 each time. Because of the cost of overtime, the squad's weekend work is restricted. As you know, that we work predominantly Monday to Friday here, and we only have a small cover of men working at the weekends. That is Saturday, Saturday only. Now, the villains that we deal with, the top-rate arm robber, they know this. They know that we don't work weekends. And it's very, very rare indeed when, if we're keeping a group of villains under surveillance, that we will be allowed to carry on and work at the weekend. We've done for observations on a person, for example, that uh, stayed indoor, indoors all week or just went shopping, uh, you know, basically hardly went out at all. And for a, I'm a young man with, uh, you know, nice car, nicely dressed, and uh, I would not a, a stay at home man at all, but not go out of doors all week. Yet come the weekend, when he knows probably we're all going to be at home because they won't let us work at weekends. He's out and about and running about all over the place. The Flying Squad do carry out surveillance at weekends, but we don't allow an officer to cancel his own rest day to work at a weekend. Tramier over two, Port Vale two. The following FA Cup ties are not on your pause coupons. You Port cannot Port let a management decision like that be taken by officers who don't have the responsibility for the end result of it. Frankly, I, I think that uh, that for officers who, as I said, are on a very generous budget, and they are on a generous budget, and they're given a great deal of freedom, they're given a great deal of trust um, to, to whinge about the occasions when they're told they can't work because of budgetary restrictions, I, I find that incredible. There seems to be quite a few discrepancies between you at Scotland Yard and the team at Tower Bridge. I don't like the idea of, of considering us being uh, apart from the, uh, the, the branch offices. I mean, we are all 
we're all the flying squad as such. But I, I think you realise from some of the people that you've met that there are a number of very strong personalities. And, I mean, even up here, uh, there are a lot of arguments between me and the rest of my management team. And there are arguments between uh, the management team up here and the branch DCIs. But to me, that's healthy. We don't want to be surrounded by yes-men. <laughs> Financial restrictions, frustrations in court, fear of being shot at, and long unsocial hours are all pressures on flying squad detectives. But perhaps the greatest pressure of all is not knowing what waits behind the door every time the squad enter a suspect's premises. The pressure that they, that, that they accept. They, they, know, they know what the job's about. They know the terms of reference. You can make the same argument with the fire brigade. I mean, a guy doesn't join the fire brigade without knowing that he's risking his life. Three floors up, I'm holding him by the ankles, and the, the curtains opened across the other side of the alleyway, <laughs> and there's all the blokes in the billiard all said, oh, I don't want to witness this. <laughs> Ladies and gents, if uh, you be kind enough to uh, be quiet just for a moment, I'd like to say a few words about our host this evening, Mr. Peter Smith. You got that right. <laughs> After 18 years' service, Peter Smith was discharged from the police as medically unfit, a condition caused by the pressure of work in the flying squad. The work I was doing it was pretty heavy. You know, when you're going out in the morning, you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what time you're going out for a start uh, quite often. And then you go out and you face uh, a situation where you know you're going to take out an armed robbery team. And obviously all of you are in the situation, whether it's on the street or knocking on someone's door or going through the door and taking them out. You don't, if you take a man out of the house, you don't know what's on the other side of the door. Research has shown that consistently you have been held in high esteem for your detective ability and your propensity to hard work. Who wrote that? <laughs> when you take someone out on the street, you might think you're taking out an unarmed person who's part of the team, but you never know when they're going to draw a gun. And underneath, I think that's what... Uh, eventually, after, you know, over a period of time, was uh, it obviously got to me inside without me realising it. Peter. Thank you very much, Bill. So, Every success, my boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Knowing that I'm leaving the police force, I've had that weight taken off my shoulder. Um, and things at home have been very good instead of a, 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 reason, a pretty volatile situation. Um, I think what really got to me, um, although I was enjoying doing the work, uh, eventually with two young children at home, I was, I got to the stage where I was saying goodbye to them. I've had a super, super career in the police force. And one of the things that I've got to do tonight uh, is that in a retiring situation, when one retires, one normally gets a bus pass. <laughs> to me tonight, as a member of the Metropolitan Police, I lose my bus pass. <laughs> <laughs> my Metropolitan Police warrant card. Mr. Mellish, please accept that because I know someone asked for it the other day. All right, Mr. Gwynn? <laughs> if OP4 has got one, OP1 has got one, OP2 yeah. has got one, yeah. and we know where they are, yeah. yeah, we can move in. But I mean, what I don't like is the idea of the main man getting inside. If he's armed, I don't, I don't like him getting inside because once he's in there, we've lost control of him. For every man who leaves the squad, there are many others waiting to join. During the first six months that Detective Chief Inspector Mellish was in charge, the Flying Squad team at Tower Bridge cleared up over half the robberies that were investigated. If, if they are he looks to the future with a certain confidence. They all come eventually. I'm quite satisfied with that. They all come eventually. It's just a matter of timing.